Welcome to A Flash of Beauty, the podcast, an audio experience dedicated to the further exploration of Bigfoot and the people Bigfoot has revealed itself to. What started as a documentary of personal narrative encounter stories and expert testimony has now shifted into a deeper inquiry into the forever changed lives of those that have witnessed firsthand this hidden truth. My name is Tobe Johnson co-producer of Flash of Beauty Bigfoot Revealed. Join me along with the crew and creators of this doc, director Brett Eichenberger, producer Jill Rimmon Snyder, and cinematographer Michael Ferry, as we go back into the trees to sit down once again with each guest in search of the truth, no matter how strange. All right, back with me here is the cinematographer, Michael Ferry, producer, Jill Rimmon Snyder, and director, Brett Eichenberger. Hello, gang. Hello. Hey, there. Hi. Good all day right. to you. Good day to you guys. All right, well, we're all in a good mood. It's good to be back uh, with you guys here. And today we have our guest, Todd Neese, a retired Army specialist out blowing up stuff near Seaside, Oregon, has an amazing encounter uh, people are in tow with him in Humvees. Uh, he looks down across a ravine and has his mind blown. We get into all the details with what he sees across the ravine. Wink, wink. It is a Sasquatch. And we uh, we talk to Todd about that. Um, we go to places in this interview that I didn't expect to go. Pleasant places, dark places, kind of sad places, weird places. But, um, you know, some of these guys I know a little bit. Todd was one of those guys I didn't expect to talk this way. And um, so for me, it was a really pleasant takeaway with some of the surprises of uh, his personal point of view. That's my takeaway. Um, what do you guys think? Well, I just want to say that that Todd has been on my radar since I was a kid. You know, I first saw Robert Stack introduce him on Unsolved Mysteries. And it was a big deal because I remember seeing the promo about a Bigfoot sighting in Oregon. And of course, I was an Unsolved Mysteries junkie. I didn't miss an episode. And so I remember watching that episode. And, um, you know, to be able to call, call Todd a friend, you know, 30 years later is extraordinary. And um, his sighting is one of the most extraordinary sightings out there for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're detonating some pretty major explosives. I would think that any animal being anything else that would be hearing these things would want to be as far away as possible from these detonations. So the fact that he saw three individuals in the blast zone is nothing short of extraordinary. And the fact that they presented themselves with all of this military presence may have been a show of force. Who knows? You know, um, that's not something he really talks about in this interview. And I, I wish I would have asked him that question, but that's bold, very, very bold. And it wasn't just Todd that saw him, you know, he's going to talk about that too. So I, I think this is a really important interview for all of the different levels that we end up going down. And, um, and I think that, you know, we really touch on one of the major themes of our film, and, and that is to normalize this conversation, to get folks to come out of their shells, if you will, and, and start talking about what, what they saw that they want answers for or can't explain. All right, Mike, what's your takeaway? Yeah, I mean, I was just struck by his, you know, his reverence for Bigfoot and what he saw and how it affected him psychologically. I mean, he, he gets deep into it here. Um, and he goes to, you know, a really personal level on how it hit him. Um, and he doesn't hold anything back. And, um, yeah, I was just, it was just really, really interesting to see where he went and, and how it affected him. Yeah. Jill. Uh, and just to add to that, uh, it was there were a lot of details uh, that he shared with us that he had not uh, shared before. And, you know, we've like Brett and I have known Todd for, gosh, when did we first meet him? Like 2012, I think? 2012. We, we actually 
met Todd at our very first beach foot. We were invited by some, some friends of ours. And um, that's really where this documentary, that was the, the, the origin of this documentary was that 2012 invite to beach foot and getting to know Todd and being able to trust Todd and, and kind of building up that rapport and getting to know some of the other folks that were attending beach foot. That's yeah, where it kind of came from. I mean, yeah, because when we were putting together this idea, when it also encompassed uh, like the more paranormal element and like UFOs and and other weird stuff, um, Todd was kind of like our entry point to to the Bigfoot uh, interviews and conversation. He was that was our in. He was our he was our uh, you know doorman to the world of Bigfoot. I mean, Mike, when you said Todd has a reverence uh, and almost a humility in front of the face and the the interactions of Sasquatch going back to his sighting, I think that's totally true. And I think it's the gateway to the uh, (laughs) to looking into the stranger aspects of it, because, you know, I kind of press him a little bit on this reverence factor because you don't have a reverence for every animal in the woods. Um, so once in a while, you'll get that from me because I do have a weirder take about what happened and, you know, in our case. And, um, I think that's kind of my job is to kind of walk that fine line with some of these guests and see if I can get some of the, you know, trickier questions answered out of them. I I don't know if I'm always going to succeed, but I, I do push a little bit harder here and I think that's okay. So, um, unless you guys have any other comments. Why don't we unleash this episode into the interweb, our interview with Todd Neese. All right, with us is retired Army Staff Sergeant Todd Neese, who had had one hell of a sighting somewhere close to Seaside, Oregon, and you see it plainly in the documentary I'd love to just go right into that sighting that you had, Todd, regarding, you know, being on a training exercise with all the uh, the Humvees around you and what was happening that day. Um, there's a lot of details, of course, on the cutting room floor yet again of this documentary. So I don't know the whole story. You and I haven't caught up about that at all. But was that your first inclination that Sasquatch was real is while you were on a training exercise? Uh, yeah, in fact, uh I have to be quite honest with you. Uh, I, I was not a quote unquote believer, uh, as such. I mean, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, you certainly hear about the Bigfoot Sasquatch legend, but that's pretty much where I classified it as just a, a good campfire tale or some, some native American lore. And, you know, um, always a bit of truth, I suppose, in every story, but I, had been pretty much agnostic when it came to the subject. I, I was not uh, uh, a believer whatsoever, uh, you know, and in, in that very area that we were in, I used to live down uh, on the coast at that time. And, and I was very avid hunter, still am um, fisherman, hiker, mountain climber. I did all, you know, all that in that area. And not once did I even for a moment think that, uh, such a, such a species could exist. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was my baptism, uh, my, my epiphany, if you will. I mean, there's a lot to get into regarding what was happening that day. You're on a training exercise. I imagine there's a squadron with you. There's certainly more than a couple individuals around you. You're all armored up. You're doing a training exercise, which involves explosions, and then all of a sudden you say, I believe across the ravine, you see three individuals and you call them civilians. Uh, walk us through this moment here a little bit slower than we're able to do in the documentary. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version. Uh, version. There's uh, um, a lot of details. And details are things I look for interview well hold on a second todd your your sig your signal's dropping off there so wherever you were standing on your head to get a good one do that again um so uh, I'll, I'll try to give you the short version um 
but um yeah so I, I was a combat engineer working with uh, uh the 1249th combat engineer battalion and uh we had uh sent a company up there delta company to uh to do this um these very large explosive um, um, training, um, and and we had three different sites, and these sites were located on private uh, timber land owned by a timber company, who we got special permission to access, and and as you can imagine, just due to the nature and the danger of what we're doing, we had uh, very heavy security to make sure that civilians could not enter that area uh, um, for obvious reasons. Um, we had completed two of the three training missions, uh, each different scenarios. Uh, and then the third and final scenario was uh, that of uh, a cratering charge. And a cratering charge, for those that don't know, it's designed to basically, like the, like the name implies, is to, to uh, basically deny the enemy a use of a road by literally blowing that road in half, you know, and, and, and making it impassable. And so we uh, took about, I think, about 250 pounds of ammonium nitrate that we had been soaking in diesel fuel and uh, dug this uh, kind of a starter hole, if you will, and placed those bags of uh, ammonium nitrate in there, uh, inserted the, the blasting caps and the uh, timing fuse and set the charges. And standard operating procedure was that we were to just, uh, you know, board our vehicles and obviously get to a safe area to await the explosion after which we'd come back and, and check our work and i think we probably had about i think it was about 11 minute uh, fuse so plenty of time to get out of there um as it was there were four vehicles two humvees in the lead uh, uh two and a half ton or what we call deuce and a half uh troop transport uh, as a third vehicle and the commander's Humvee uh, bringing up the rear. I was a passenger in that second Humvee, uh, and as such, I sat right behind the the driver. And it was a very nice day for, for April in the coast range, and so I had the window open, and I'm just – at being a hunter, it was natural for me to look around the countryside since I wasn't having to focus on that that winding, narrow um, logging road to to look for wildlife. And we rounded this corner, this this long sweeping uh, right-handed corner, and the. The, the second blast site, the one we had detonated, you know, uh, maybe 30 to minutes to an hour earlier, came into view. And uh, the wildlife I saw was uh, something I did not expect by any means. In fact, you had mentioned my uh, calling them civilians. Well, that was about a two second fleeting thought. My, uh, when I looked down there, I saw these three figures standing upright, facing the convoy as we're descending this, this hill and getting away from this, this impending explosion. My, it just instinctively, my first thought was, oh my God, what are those people doing down there? You know, because uh, again, the, the heavy security quarter that we had going on, but you know, I hardly finished that thought when I, the more I looked, I realized almost instantaneously that what I was looking at were not humans by any stretch of the imagination. And by that, I mean, their, their, their size, their color, their, their silhouette, all of it um, was uh, very unhuman, I guess. Um, uh, size wise, um, again, there were three and the, and the, the one that was 
in the center of the three. And if you can visualize them lining up shoulder to shoulder, the one in the middle had to be every bit as nine feet tall, uh, huge. And, and of course, the um, proportionate, uh, proportionally wide shoulders. And, and they honestly, they, they look like bodybuilders, uh, uh, um, broad shoulders, barrel chest, tapered waist. But the, what really threw me were, were the, the length of the arms reached nearly to their knees and the legs as well were, were very disproportionately long compared to that of, of, uh, humans. Um, the two that flanked that larger one, and, and I should state that that larger one just stood there like a statue. It wasn't, it didn't move at all, but the two on either side of it exhibited this, um, swaying motion, if you will, rocking left and right, like it's shifting weight from foot to foot. And, and in the process, these long pendulous arms swinging down at their knees. And they did that the entire time I watched them. And uh, speaking of time, this wasn't a very, you know, brief three second, something ran in front of my car kind of a uh, glimpse. It was uh I estimate about 25 seconds, so nearly a half a minute. I'm watching these things, and uh, like I said, the whole time these these two either side of the larger one uh, just did this, you know, Watusi or whatever you want to call it. But they they did it nonstop until eventually we took the corner, and I lost sight of them and just pretty much collapsed into my seat and. As you can imagine, my head was just swimming with uh, a million questions, and, and um, I mean, I was in shock, to be honest with you. And you know, your mind just goes is racing with a, a, a hundred questions, and 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 uh, uh, it, was, it was fantastic, and at the same time, it was it was very um, um, traumatic. I think. I mean, in terms of not so much in terms of my feeling uh, I was in any sort of uh, danger or anything, just, just the trauma of seeing something like that, I'm sure you can imagine. So the um, story didn't quite end there. We did get down to that staging area, which wasn't much further. And uh, at that point, I um, I just instinctively, when I got out of my vehicle and I knew I had a couple more coming down behind me, I took advantage of that time to kind of jog back up in the direction we had just came. I was uh, really hoping to um, get another view of them. And uh, I went as far as I dared. We had a, a policy where we had to, be, everybody had to be within, you know, high shot of each other. Everybody had to be accounted for. Uh, but I had, I, I went as far as I dared. And uh, unfortunately, this little berm was blocking my view of that, of that uh, quarry where I'd seen him at. And it was at that time that somebody, I heard somebody yell out my name, uh, my last name, uh, says, hey niece. And I look over and uh, approaching me was a fellow soldier, Sergeant Martin. And and, and uh, I look over, I go, yeah. And he goes, what are you looking at? And I dropped my hand to my side. And I go, oh, man, nothing. And, and he just continued on up. And once he got up to where I was, uh, he kind of looked left and right, you know, make sure nobody else was in earshot. And he said, uh, I don't suppose you saw what I saw down at that second blast site. And of course I said, I don't know, Jeff, what did you see? Um, <laughs> uh, cause I, I had no idea what he had seen, like I kind of thought I might. Um, but he proceeded to describe exactly what I had seen. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, same number, same description, black, no clothing, huge, uh, muscular, uh, uh, in, in his own words, he said, I, big foot, I guess. And I said, well, yeah, I, I saw them too. And, uh, uh, just as a footnote, uh, being, being that I was in the national guard and that we were training on a monthly basis, it would be the next month in May that we had two more soldiers come up independently and admit to also being uh, eyewitnesses to what Jeff and I had seen. So it's a, it, it's a unique sighting um, 
in so much as multiple animals, uh, multiple Bigfoot are, are not seen that often together. Uh, multiple eyewitnesses um, uh, are fairly um, rare. And then, and then, of course, just the nature of what we were doing. I mean, we were out there blowing up the woods and... Uh, and these things obviously came out to investigate and uh, uh, suffice to say, it's been 30 years now and I've been researching ever since. Wow. So when it comes to Jeff's uh, admitting that he saw the same thing that you saw, is this something that um, you guys talked about with senior leadership later? What was what was done about this? No, you know, like most eyewitnesses, um, most people I, I would come to find over the years of interviewing people that really keep it to themselves. They don't discuss it uh, um, publicly. Um, and, um, uh, you, know, you know, my my reputation was really important to me at the time. I mean, I'm a I was not only a non-commissioned officer in the military, but I was, uh, you know, a family man and vice president of a shipping company in Portland. And, and so it was really a, a difficult decision for me to come forward, let alone talk to my, uh, my, uh, senior command. Um, I do recall, uh, that I kind of drew this poster, uh, a drawing of a, of a, you know, silhouette of a Bigfoot and um, put my contact information on it. And there we have several bulletin boards throughout the armory and I stuck one up on a bulletin board and uh, in hopes somebody else might come forward. And uh, uh, it didn't last more than about an hour or two before somebody removed it. So I just let it go. Wow. So there's no protocol that you knew of reporting this there was no scuttlebutt around the office no again like i said between uh between jeff and i uh sergeant martin um we we pretty much kept it to ourselves you know we didn't want to get uh <laughs> what they call section eight you know discharge for being uh uh crazy so um yeah so it, it wasn't something that we discuss it, but yeah, over time, I have to say, and especially having served 20 years and being featured on a number of um, television shows and, and, and speaking at different conferences around, uh, as well as podcasts, you know, it's, it, it became pretty well known throughout uh, uh, the units that I worked with and uh, nothing was really, you know, made of it, you know, uh, everything was kind of tongue in cheek and, uh, you know, and I had a few soldiers actually, um, support me in it, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to keep the two separate, you know, my, Todd, my duty in, in this situation. Todd is Brett. I mean, it was um, just circumstantial that it happened under those, uh, conditions, but, uh, anyhow, so yeah, I, I pretty much, you know, kept it to myself. So Todd, uh, Brett here, um, can you talk about, we haven't had a chance to really talk about this with some of our other guests, but it's a, it's a major component of our documentary. And that component is the psyche and the psychological aspect of it. Can you describe, you know, kind of where your head was at in, you know, your state of mind in the days and weeks that followed that extraordinary sighting? Well, it's interesting you should say that because I have, <laughs> by interviewing a number of other eyewitnesses and com kind of comparing notes, if you will, between what I went through in, in fairly rapid succession, um, I have come up with a, um, it seems to be a, a fairly consistent um, series of reactions, if you will, um, by eyewitnesses. And then, uh, uh, of course, it, it depends on the conditions. You know, certainly if you're much closer, or uh, you'd probably be a danger element. But it, at the same time, 
there was, um, you know, st stage one, and this can happen literally within minutes, uh, depending on the situation again. But um, initially, there is this um, shock uh, phase, right, that you go through, which is almost immediately followed by this denial. And, and again, I, this is, this is after interviewing a lot of different eyewitnesses over 30 years, this, this, this abject denial, this can't be what I'm looking at, you know? And I kind of, I went through that myself. I, I remember like initially when I saw like, are those, are those people? No, uh, they're moving. So they're animate. So they there's some sort of animal. Are they bears? Well, what are they? Are the bears standing up, you know, simultaneously and and and, uh, and behaving the way they were? And then you know, you start kind of going through this laundry list of it can't be what I'm seeing. So this, so the shock, uh, this denial phase, and and within, and then, you know, now you may be only five seconds into it, and there's this this acceptance, uh, this 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 point at which you, you just you can't you can't unsee what you're seeing and you and you can't deny uh what you're looking at um and then they're just kind of in awe if you will trying to trying to soak it all in and what's really interesting Brett, is that once and, and that's something i never expected but once you lose sight of them and in my case we took this corner um and 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 we lost sight of them like i said i just i kind of collapsed back in my seat and again like i said uh, you know 100 questions swirling through my head you know how could they be out there as many times i've been out there hunting and fishing and hiking how could i have not even seen sign of them which in you know in retrospect i probably did but because i didn't believe they existed I, I probably dismissed it right out of hand you know just all these questions and and the final thing and, and you might find this <laughs> unusual but there is a moment of depression and and sense. by that it's it's like you like you just saw god and you you realize that, that a you had no control over the situation it it happened to you you didn't make it happen and it's in, in a way it's like winning the lottery and then having somebody grab that money and run off with it you know it's like and that's why when we got down to that that staging area uh i when I say I instinctually ran back up there, it's a, it was it was almost involuntary. I had to do whatever I could to try to regain that that experience. And once you realize you can't, um, I'm not kidding you when I say I kind of went into a kind of a depressive mode. I mean, forget about who's going to believe you because there's no way you can prove it anyway. You know, um, it was great that I had, you know, corroboration by Jeff and eventually those other two soldiers, but it wouldn't have changed anything for me. You know, it was it was something that was meant to happen. It was meant for me to see. And frankly, I guess if you want to put a, a, a final footnote on it, for me anyway, is this desire to find a purpose you know when it's all said and done it's you know this this why me why not somebody else you know had we been a minute later or a minute earlier uh had i been engaged in the conversation with the passenger in the front seat you know i wouldn't even be looking that direction it was just i mean everything came together uh, in order for that to happen. And so, yeah, um, ultimately, um, I guess if I'm to take any solace in what I saw, it's to try to find a purpose, something 
something worthy of what I've seen, something that that uh, will help not just help me, but others try to appreciate and understand that we don't know everything. You know, we, we, we tend to be, um, I think we know everything. And uh, that, that epiphany, like I call it, was a real wake up call to me. And so my, my efforts, as you know, with the, uh, the nonprofit uh, um, organization I've put together, the American Primate Conservancy is just that to, to conserve uh, conservation, to find out if there's somehow some, you know, if, if maybe the purpose in what I saw is to not just bring awareness to their existence, but also to, if, if at all possible, do whatever it takes to determine the, the health of the species to, to, um, you know, we don't know how many are out there right now. And, and more to the point, we don't know how many were there a thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago or a thousand years from now. And I just, I would feel, uh, remorse if I didn't take what happened to me and try to turn it into something positive. And, and so that's that ultimately our goal is to get them officially recognized and, and to uh, once that happens, then we can try to enact some, uh, some measures to, to ensure their, their well being. And I want to make sure that my, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids, it, at the very least, as, as remote as it could be, I want to make sure that they have it, at least as uh, well of a chance to experience what I experienced that day. And uh, so, so I, I guess in a nutshell, there's there's like five or six different steps there which I just went through, but it, but a lot of it just comes in rapid succession. It's just like boom, 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 and then all of a sudden it's like a safe, <laughs> uh, you know, and a, and a, just as quickly as it happens, it disappears, and and um, so, uh, but I, I have seen those and, and that that same kind of progression. Uh, again, like I say, it depends on how close you are. If somebody, I mean, I was uh, I was a decent distance away to where I didn't feel threatened, but I mean if. I've talked to a lot of people that were literally within feet of these things. And of course that, that probably brings in an entirely different mental component. I, I can imagine, but, um, but yeah, there is, there is some consistency in this, this, um, this, um, the, these emotions that just, uh, that, that's this mental states that you go through and, but uh, yeah, Todd, that's a that, good question. Hold on that thought for a second here. Um, Mike, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick one. Um, you know, Todd, I know you're there doing a job and a mission and a serious mission at that. But I mean, how, how, how do you find the strength to hold that excitement, that shock, that, you know, disbelief? How do you hold that back when you get out of the Humvee? I mean, did you... What did it take? And then did you see any sort of, you know, tells from any of the other soldiers, you know, that they might have seen something too, other than Jeff? I mean, I if I would have got out of that car, I would have been, you know, I, I, I don't know how I would have reacted. I'm just curious how you, you know, how you held it back. So um, I don't know if you've ever ridden in a Humvee or the original H1s. They're very wide, right? Uh, super wide bodies. And so, um, so to the, to my left is this this ravine going down. Um, the driver's fixated on on the road. It's very narrow, windy road. The the alternate driver or the A driver, as we call it, is sitting on the other side of the jeep and has no no visual on what I'm seeing. And uh, like I say, the driver's fixated on the on on, uh, on the road. So I was the only passenger in the back of this 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 Humvee. And so it was natural for me to suspect I was the only one that saw this. Um, and I was convinced of that. In fact, I was quite shocked that when, when uh, Sergeant Martin came up to me uh, shortly after we arrived at the safety staging area. Um, how do you, 
how do you keep it to yourself? Well, um, again, I mean, I, there was no, I have long since passed this, this stage of, of denial. Um, again, you can't unsee what I saw, but at the same time, how do you express that to anybody who didn't experience the same thing you did? Again, it's like, it's almost like, you know, I hate to, I hate the analogy, but I mean, it's almost like seeing God, you know, how do you then turn and, and describe that to somebody? How do you, and, and would you just do it randomly uh, in, in the middle of a, an exercise like that? It, it's, it, it was, a, it was a incredibly awkward position to be in. And like I said, had, had uh, Sergeant Martin not, not approach me and, concur with with what I had seen uh who knows where I'd be um I I I doubt I would have brought it up with anybody um I will say this we had what we called an open post and I don't generally talk about this but so an open post means that at the end of the day when we have our final formation you're free to grab a, your mummy bag and cr you know crash on the drill floor or get a motel, or if you have friends in the area, you're welcome to leave, uh, spend the night anywhere in the in the general area as long as you're back in in formation in the morning. And so that night, I chose to uh, stay with uh, my platoon sergeant and his wife. We we were friends before I even joined the guard, and I did open up with them that evening. Um, I mean, I, you got to tell somebody, right. And, and if you're going to tell anybody, you're going to tell somebody that's a, that's a very, very close person that knows you're not prone to, you know, making up stories or, 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 or you know, seeing ghosts and UFOs and whatever else, you know, or Bigfoot, you know? So I did confide with, uh, um, uh, Sergeant Braden and his wife, uh, that night, but uh, you know, and I got these kind of uh, patronizing uh, looks from them, like, oh, that's nice, uh, have another drink. No, but uh, so it was like, no, serious, it happened. So, um, but no, I, it, and it's funny over time how I, I did um, when I when I got back to my civilian job, um, I, I discussed it with my father. Um, and uh, a business associate and kind of a funny thing uh, came from that we since we brought up Tillamook earlier we had a we had a secretary that worked for us in the office that that was born and raised in Tillamook went to Tillamook High School and and uh, in discussing this with my buddy um, about where it had happened in the coast range he goes you know what if anybody knows anything about Bigfoot. You ought to talk to Melissa. She, you know, she lives in she lives in the Coast Range. Or she lives in Tillamook, and you ought to ask her. So I, I ultimately I got up the nerve to go talk to her, and um, make sure, again make sure nobody else is in earshot. And I said, Hey Melissa, I said um, you grew up in Tillamook, right? She goes, Oh yeah, all my life. And then I had to pop that question, and I was like, so, like, growing up in Tillamook, did you guys ever, I don't know, um, hear any stories about Bigfoot? And her response just floored me. Um, without even batting an eye, she goes, oh, you mean cape apes? I go, what? He goes, cape apes, that's what we called them. Like I was talking about a cow or deer or dog, it was so nonchalant, and she was just so unplussed for the whole about the whole thing. It's like, oh yeah, cave apes. Um, it's it was just it, it's like, yeah, sure, all the time, you know. Um, not what I expected, and in fact, I've kind of incorporated that name into a a novel I'm working on uh, called the Cave Apes of Saddle Mountain. But, uh, yeah, it was just, you know, what? and I, you look at all the different slang terms, the different Native American terms, everything that's out there. Uh, I have yet to see cave apes. 
Hey, Todd. So you were talking about how this was such a positive experience for you and you were able to find purpose, but I'd have to imagine that this could drive some people crazy trying to find, uh, Mm. trying to Mm -hmm. find answers. Well, uh, and you'd be right. Um, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, it seems like, and I'm sure you've had the same experience, but it seems like it, almost anywhere you go, if you're in a public setting and you happen to be discussing the topic of Bigfoot, there's always a, you know, somebody with their ears open in the background that's kind of um, picking up on it. And, um, you know, a restaurant or a, a bar or whatever, you, you're having this conversation. And I can't tell you how many times I've been approached by individuals um, and, and, and they, they would say, uh, well, um, excuse me, but did I, were you talking about Bigfoot? Did I understand you? And I hear one of two things. I hear you you know who you need to talk to or you know who you should talk to and they want to give me a name or you're probably going to think I'm crazy. And I'm like, okay, hang on a minute. I got a pen and paper. Let's go. Because it, 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 it amazes me that it seems like everywhere you go, somebody either has had an experience or knows somebody who has, and especially more, you know, in rural areas, but, but I've gotten so much, um, uh, good information, research, um, uh, happenstance like that. I mean, just out of the blue by the, your least likely source. But what strikes me is I make sure I ask the question. I go, okay, okay. You told me this story. You gave me your, you told me about your encounter. Who have you told about this? And you wouldn't believe how many times they say like well you and you know it's like it's like they're starving to find some some outlet that they feel can legitimize their experience you know a lot of times they've yeah they bury it you know and it haunts them it does you know oh i how how long ago was this well i was 12 and they're like 40 and you're like going and you've never told anybody well, no, you know, um, um, so it's, I, I think it's important to, to appreciate that, that there are people that just flat out are traumatized by their experience that it, it, it probably eats them alive. To be honest with you, Jill, I, I think, you know, and, and when they, do find somebody that they believe will believe them. It is therapeutic. I remember I was speaking up in Vancouver, British Columbia in 1997 at the University of British Columbia. And I had just got done talking and the MC, Steve Harvey came up to me. I was tapping me on the shoulder. He goes, there's a young man out there in the in the atrium that just came in and had a sighting yesterday and i really think you should talk to him so i went out there and uh his name is scott mcdonald and in fact i think his story is pretty pretty well known now but he was bear hunting along the fraser river just outside of vancouver and this was the day before and um Somebody had already got to him. Somebody was starting to talk with somebody. Somebody heard that he had had this, or maybe he had just started sharing it with somebody else. But when Steve came up and introduced me to him and said, you need to talk to Todd. He's, he has, is an eyewitness himself. He's, a, he's had an experience. The, the guy pretty much dropped this other conversation and, and he and I stepped aside. And it's so interesting because you'll what I try to preface everything by saying, look, before you even say a word, let me tell you, been there, seen that, okay? I know what you've seen, and 
I understand. The information you get from that individual versus anybody else, I truly believe is priceless because there's a big difference between opening up to somebody who may or may not believe they exist versus somebody who you've shared that experience with. And you watch the expression on their face completely change. They're, they drop their defense, their shoulders drop, their eyes widen, and it's like, oh, my God, you too. Oh, my God, let me tell you about mine. And they, and they go into details that you, probably nobody else would ever get. But, again, you're right. I think, I think it, it, it is, for some people, therapeutic to – to just find an outlet that's going to really take them seriously because it is a traumatic experience and it does change your life as it did mine. Brett, I know you have a question here, but man, we're on a roll with this. Um, I didn't expect to go down this rabbit hole with you, Todd. I'm caught <laughs> off. I'm, well, I'm caught off guard by some of the things that you've said here and <laughs> it stems from your comments based upon what you're talking about with calling them godlike. And the only other person I know that has talked that way about Sasquatch is me. I've never heard anybody else say that before, but there is this. Um, it's the Holy Grail. Well, yeah, you know? it's it's this, um, you call it a lottery that's been stolen out of your hands. I totally get what you're saying. I sympathize with those comments so much, but I want to, I want to ask you deeper about this question, calling it godlike because it is, when that moment is gone and you chase that monkey to have that experience again, knowing that your worldview is shattered and reshifted on that day, in your case, in, you know, near Seaside, Oregon, in the military, it happens different ways for different folks all over the world. A long experience, a short experience, some people handle it bad, some people handle it good. Some people get driven crazy by it, become obsessed with it or run from it. Um, you know, all this is featured in the doc, but you don't have those kind of experiences about a rare species. You don't have those kind of experiences about a chimp. You don't have those kind of experiences about a right. relic hominid. So what the hell is going on? I, I think a lot of it so stems from the legacy, the legend that has been built around it through the media, um, through um, exploitation, through commercialization. Uh, the subject isn't always given the respect it deserves. Um, there's hoaxers out there. But it, you know, let's face it, Bigfoot, just the name itself, it, it's a pop icon, right? It's I mean, I think to a degree, everybody wants to believe that, you know, something like that does exist or can exist. But like I say, through uh, it's it's one of these things that has just taken on a life of its own. Uh, you know, starting back, you know, when Europeans first came over here, and and of course, far before that, with Native American lore but you know as as uh, media has grown so has the legend and so um i don't know it's it's like i say it's taken on a life of its own but you never really expect it to take on a life well let me I mean, todd are you bothered by any real aspects life. I'm sorry to interrupt here, but are you bothered yeah. by any aspects as it pertains to what Sasquatch may be? I'm not sure I follow you. Well, I mean, have you are you fully invested in the theory that these are what they present themselves to be on on that sighting that you had? You saw what looked like a primate with attributes of humanity with it, just based upon the fact that well, there was a yeah. unit, but are you toying mm -hmm. with this privately that there may be something more complicated going on? Is that why you use the word godlike? I, you know, not so much. Um, so 
let's be clear. Um, biologically speaking, humans are primates. We fall into that category. We are animals. First and foremost, we are primates. And within the primate chain, of course, there's there's lesser apes, there's there's pongidids, there's greater apes, and the humans. Hence, uh, Homo sapien uh, means that you have sapiens or sentience. That you know we are, you know, primate means the the prime of of, of really the animal kingdom. And so humans fall in that category. A lot of people make that 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 distinction, but. Uh, we are in that same uh, zoological classification. That being said, um, the jury's still out as to where this species falls in terms of of evolution. You know, um, the I, I, I have I have kind of gone full circle in this thinking that, yeah, maybe we're talking about a great ape or something of that nature, but the physiological differences in terms of being bipedal versus quadrupedal, uh, and, uh, and by no means I'm a biologist, uh, but I mean the bone structure, the muscle structure, everything would is so far off of that of, of a, say, a gorilla uh, or, or a, uh, orangutan, for instance. Um, yeah, certainly they can walk bipedal but not for long periods this is an, uh, a species that is is adapted to bipedal walking for the uh, the most part which leads me to believe that maybe we're dealing with this is um some relic hominid um uh, akin to that of uh, cromagnon neanderthal uh or, or or a species yet you know along those lines that we, we have yet to established but um uh, you know it wasn't that long ago that we we discovered the homo florensis uh, uh, there's some small people over there in in the uh, indonesia um the history books have yet to be written and that's what we're looking for as far as them being godlike uh, the only thing i really um associate God with these things is just really um, the fact that I believe there was a purpose. Uh, 25 seconds. Think about this. 25 seconds changed my entire life 30 years ago. 25 seconds. Why? And that's where I, I, I feel that it was it was destiny. It was it was preordained it was I, there's got to be a purpose in it and that's 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 where i leave it at this point but yeah i do make that analogy of it's like seeing god you know because it's just it's just not it's not that it's not supposed to be it's just like you're not supposed to see that and bam and suddenly it's in your face so you you've got no choice but to deal with it or not deal with it and drive yourself nuts you know so i've chose to deal with it Todd, um, there's so much going on right now in the world of UFOs and disclosure, and it seems like something or someone comes forward every single day, whether it's a commercial airline pilot or another military pilot or something. You know, obviously, us in the Bigfoot community are, are hoping that one day we can get rid of this taboo so the folks out there that have seen these things and have had these experiences can come forward and that's part of our mission with our documentary is to give this, you know, we wanted to do something that had a National Geographic type feel to it because, you know, the other movies and stuff we felt have kind of put a bad name on this, this being. And we want to get people to the point where they can be comfortable to talk about it. What do you think it's going to take in order for society to start thinking and realizing that more people out there that have probably seen a Bigfoot than have seen a mountain lion in the wild what do you think it's going to take right. to get people to start talking well first off let let me say to 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 you all and by you all i mean the team you jill so mike i guess i i thoroughly enjoyed not only working with you guys on that for gosh almost a year and a half uh, in fact i think i lost 40 pounds from the first time we started filming it 
to the end, but, um, you and me both. Um, <laughs> ah, yeah. So no, but no, what I really, and I've told this to, to many people, and I, uh, many as I can really talk to about it. It's just, I like, I, I've, I've done the better part of maybe 30 of these, uh, the TV productions and by far your approach is the best documentary I've, I've ever uh, seen this because of the approach you, you take on it. And, and I really, really appreciate the way you handle it. Um, so much. You're right about, about the uh, other shows that, that are out there. They, they, there's this, this tendency to sensationalize everything or over sensationalize it. And, uh, the production you put together was just, um, it was so down to earth and, and the eyewitnesses you had were unbelievably well, believable, if that's a <laughs> proper phrase, um, sincere, I, I think is the proper word, not sensational, but sincere. And, and I applaud you for the, the direction you, you took it. And I think that's what it's going to take. I think I I think we need to. What's the word I'm looking for? We need we need to uh, try to normalize this to as much as we can without sensationalizing it. And then when we do, and and it's through interviews like what you you were able to assemble to to try to make it more palatable. Uh, and believable, and that's exactly what she did. And and I would say, yeah, you, you got you've got the right formula, you've got the right recipe, and and just keep it up. Cool, thank you, Todd. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. That's what we're going to try and do. In closing, here, Todd, um, you have some events coming up yourself. In fact, you're the founder of Beachfoot. If people don't know what Beachfoot is, it's an invite only yearly meeting are you having another beach foot out here in the pacific northwest absolutely uh in fact this year will mark our 16th um annual gathering um as you i hate to call it a conference because it's uh, you've been there and you know it's 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 a whole different uh animal in the in that it's it's not open to the public. There's not a bunch of vendors. There's there's no media there. It's I tend to think of it more along the lines of a, of a retreat, uh, if you will, for uh, researchers, um, really from internationally. We've had we've had people from Australia, England, Russia, New Zealand, and all across the U.S. and Canada, and and we're looking forward to to it, it growing. Uh, but we do cap it at 100 people. And it's just something in 2008 that I came up with that as far as uh, I just thought, what would it be like to get all these people I've met over the years together in a private setting and get them to talk to each other instead of sitting on their research and, and coveting it and, 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 and some of the, the, the – get rid of some of the competition between each other and, and just – I mean, what a what a brain trust of information, and get them to network and 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 share, and that's what it started out as, and it's really uh, taken on a life of its own, and so we're looking forward to it uh, this year. It'll be the I would say the last weekend in in June, um, but it's a lot of fun. It's four days, three nights, uh, getting these people not only together, it, it talk about uh, rustic. We we Nobody gets a shower for three or four days, and and we all get to see each other with double on our faces. Well, guys, anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we we you know we get a little ripe toward the end, and like you know you pretty really uh, you really get to know each other on a on probably a more personal basis than what you want to. But it's it's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it, uh, and it it will go on whether. You know, I get hit by a bus tomorrow or not. It's like I say, taking on a life of its own. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, and uh, and uh, it's doing exactly what I intended to, and that's bringing researchers together and getting them to to put aside any differences and competition and 
and all that. And uh, we've had pretty much everybody who's anybody in Bigfooting there for, at one time or another. And sadly, a number of which have passed away. Um, but uh, just happy to have had them there. And so that's going on. Um, and yeah, and people can go online too, Forks. can't they, Todd? They can go look up. Uh, there's probably archive footage of previous Beachfoots out on YouTube yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, we have a Facebook page. It's American Primate Conservancy Facebook page. And I would encourage um, anybody listening to this to just uh, go to the photo gallery and just look back over, you know, 15 years of of gatherings. And, I mean, you just tell by the expressions on people's face just how much how much they're enjoying each other and how much love, really, Um uh, they have for one another, and uh, and I do have a uh, I do have a website, AmericanPrimate.org. Um, it's currently under construction, but of course they always are. Uh, but that'll be uh, updated soon. Um, and if anyone wants to get to get a hold of me personally, they can certainly uh, email me at AmericanPrimate at AOL dot com. All right. And you're going to be present coming up here Memorial Day weekend. Uh, you're going to be in tow at the second annual Fork Sasquatch Days. Coming up, premiere of Flash of Beauty Part 2, Paranormal Bigfoot. I believe that's going to be on the, 25th, or the 26th uh, coming up as well. And then uh, we have some people from the documentary besides Todd that are going to show up there too. So if you want to meet the cast, you want to meet the crew, you want to meet Todd, you want to meet some of the other people, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, this is like Todd, you were saying, this is where the other stories come from. They don't necessarily come from podcasts. You hear the rest of the story after the microphones get set down after the people head to the tavern and, you know, they have a little liquid lubrication and the real stories start to come out. So <laughs> I, I urge you to do yeah. that. And, um, so yeah, any other projects, anything else we need to know? You know, I would like to put something out if you don't mind. Uh, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Scott and Hannah Violetti. Um, uh, Squatch America is is their moniker, and they're actually up here on Mount Hood right now, uh, staying actually next door in uh, at the Mount Hood uh, Village uh, RV Park. They're going to be here for a couple of weeks, but they have put together. Uh, for anybody in the in the Portland metro area, or or up here on the mountain, uh, they put together a town hall. It's going to be on April 28th. Um, they're getting some some media out there about it, um, but it's it's going to be a little town of zigzag. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's probably a, you know pop. Well, we'll probably double the population that day, but uh, <laughs> probably probably about you know. Couple hundred people live in that in that little hamlet. Um, anyway, it's going to be at the Zigzag Inn again, April twenty eighth. Uh, I believe it's five to six. I could be wrong, but I'll I'll put something out there. But in, in any event, it's just going to be a, a, an open mic town hall kind of situation that they're going to uh, present and uh, let people chat about their experiences in the area. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Because, All right, that's uh, that's, up here like that's free of charge. 14. People can just walk into the zigzag Absolutely cafe. Absolutely free of charge. Okay. They are uh, going through Eventbrite, but again, there's no charge for tickets. You just got to kind of go through the Eventbrite process and and say, hey, I want one, two, three tickets, whatever, and uh, and you're in. And how but do anyway, they get tickets? How I'm do they get tickets that. again, Todd? Um, I would look up Squatch America or. Um, uh, you know what? I'll send you the link, okay. and 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 maybe you can get it out to to. Or your they can go on again, Facebook. Did... Can they reach out on Facebook to uh, to this couple? I know who you're talking about. What are their names again? Yeah, uh, Scott and Hannah uh, Berkov uh, Violente, I believe. I, it's <laughs> you know, it's a, one of them. Violette. Uh, Violette. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's uh, it's Italian. But they're out there. I'll send you a link. Maybe you can, okay. you can help me get the word out. But if you're in the, anywhere in the, you know, Pacific Northwest, specifically Portland, greater mm -hmm. Portland metro area or up toward Mount okay. Hood, 
we'd love love to have you. It's, it's, uh, but that's really <laughs> other than that. The wife and I are planning to go, um, kind of do some uh, crypto tripping around the country here with uh, the trailer and uh, try to hit some other events and and do some uh, research while we're on the road. So, but all right. Yeah. Crypto Trippin, I like that name. Um, in fact, send me that information. I'll put it in the show notes here. So when the show uh, comes out, uh, we can just attach it into the show notes. Um, I look forward to seeing you. We're almost 30 days out from hanging out in Forks, Washington. Mike? I can't wait. Jill, Brett, any last closing words? Thank you, Thank Todd. You, Todd. And when you're out oh, uh, traveling the nation in search of cryptids, Make sure to wear your Flash of Beauty sweatshirt. Well, yeah, and I've got this bumper sticker on my Porsche that ah! advertises is still, that. Is it really mm. still on there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it looks good, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'll promote you guys as much as I can. Uh, I love you guys, and, uh, and uh, again, kudos on your success. Uh, Well-deserved. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hopefully you don't hate us after you watch the uh, paranormal Bigfoot, but I, I think you're, I think <laughs> right. you're going to love it too. And right, right, right. Turning out great. I'm there's, sure. there's room for all the weirdos. All right. Thanks again, Todd, for right. uh, hanging out with all us. Right. This has been a Resonance Productions podcast. If you have questions, comments, or your own encounter story you would like to relate to the show, email us at bigfootrevealpod at gmail.com. Also, if you're just discovering us, you can watch our documentary, A Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed, on most major video streaming platforms. 